Hello, we continue with the Greetings Earthling program, part of Brodo's unique sustainability conversations. First, I wanted to alert you to the art exhibit that accompanies the conference. Uh, you can click on the uh, link directly in the pop-up. Uh, it explores through art the themes of the conference and it's uh, curated by Margaret Lejeune, who's also moderator of this panel. Uh, one of the key ideas behind Brodo's experiment is that artists have unique knowledge uh, and can make science more robust. There are many examples of science teams employing artists to add depth to research. Uh, that means that artists can do much more than data visualization or science communications. Uh, they can be untapped resources to expand thinking and in collaboration spark new ideas. And as it turns out, the majority of our audience, 60% or more, are artists looking for a legitimate foothold in the climate response. As is our tradition, this panel is made up of artists. Uh, it's called Agency Art as Civics Teacher, and it features an artist from South Australia, South Africa, and uh, the moderator beaming in from the US. This is our most geographically diverse panel ever, uh, bringing earthlings from both hemispheres and from three continents. Before we get started, a special thank you to our critical and ongoing sponsors and private donors. As you know, Brodo Art Climate Science is a program of the Cape Cod Center for Sustainability, which is a registered 501c3 charity. We have done this program online and for free. But that means we have to rely on our attendees to support us financially, especially for us tiny nonprofits in the COVID era when funding has evaporated. If you can help us, even with a small donation in support of this program and future art sci initiatives by Brodo, please click the link in the pop-up. Now, on with our panel inspired by global citizenship. Thank you for watching. Hello, my name is Margaret Lejeune. I'm an associate professor of art at Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois, and I will be moderating our session on agency today, in which we will explore the links between global citizenship, the arts, and science. I'm pleased to welcome two incredibly talented artists to the discussion today. First is Hanin Kanradi whose creative practice investigates the concept of place through paintings, ritual performance, and research focused on belonging. As an Afrikaner living in Southern Africa, she is interested in the various paths that have led to human alienation from the natural world in the West, but specifically in Africa. Next, welcome Ian Gibbons, who is a poet, video artist, and electronic musician, whose former career as a neuroscientist and professor of anatomy informs his artistic practice. He currently lives and works in Southern Australia uh, on Garner land. I'd like to begin the discussion by addressing the title of this session and the concurrent Brodo Art Sci Exhibition Agency. The term agency can be defined as the capacity, condition, or state of acting or exerting power. Some questions for our panel to consider. How can artists act as agents to address the real and imagined boundaries of our planet in relation to the climate crisis? What responsibility do we have as visual thinkers to generate momentum for change? And what does it mean to have agency as an artist, as an earthling? Ian, do you want to start us off? Mm, yeah, sure. So I think in the terms of agency, artists have uh, a unique position to present a view of the world as it is now and as it might be in some imagined future, some imagined present, perhaps even an imagined past, that, that so people can help un, help people understand how we get to where we are, why we might be here now and what we're doing now, and then how things might evolve into the future. So artists and art in general has the ability to inform, it can stimulate, it can challenge, often all at the same time, and in the context of collaboration, often in, through very, very many different approaches, different techniques, different ways of, of looking. And I think one of the great things about, we'll come up to this later, about collaborative work, it, it gives huge opportunity to expand on all of those options and have them all potentially um, in the same place at the same time, which is a pretty unusual thing thing to happen. Um, and I think the other thing coming from my 
science background is that through art and all its forms, from writing through to visual art, through to performance, music, there are, have creative ways of addressing global problems that are unavailable to scientists. So the best example of that is that as an artist, you're not bound by data. <laughs> as important as data is, as important as all of all of science is based on on evidence, on replication, all the rest of it. That only gets you so far when it comes to dealing with, with large issues. And I think that art has the ability to take data where necessary, but then to transform it and use it in ways that it that are, are actually outside the range of what a scientist can do. The, the thing that artists have and uh, that our practice really, um, what is the word I'm looking for, that our, that our practice develops in us um, is that we often have a goal of where we want to go to and then halfway towards the, go the goal, we suddenly realize, no, that there are actually a few the options here and then we bifurcate and then we we start going down a whole other route and we end up in a completely different place and i think the role of art and the agency of art today is um and i think i might have said this to you before is that we can't actually fix our problems with the way that we are thinking now, which actually caused uh, the situation we find ourselves in. And so artists can go into that space, which goes beyond the data, like Ian said, and it goes beyond also language. Um, it goes beyond certain habitual ways of thinking. And we can then uncover new information or perhaps very old information from the past that we have forgotten mm -hmm. about. And that comes through uh, this, this incredible thing that, that artists have. I don't know what you want to call it, a muse, inspiration, creativity. There is this mysterious thing or spirit that we work with. And we have the freedom to work in that space, right? Like yes. instead of having to prove a hypothesis or something of that sort, right? As the sciences, you know, getting back to Ian's idea of data and such, we have more freedom, right? To to do that bifurcation you spoke of, to to engage with these ideas that might pop up along the way that we didn't intend to sort of find, but they find us and it allows us to work across boundaries right, in, in many disciplines, in many ways. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next question. Hanin Conradi and I have been collaborators. We met at the Global Nomadic Art Project, GNAP for short, held in Dartington, England in 2018. Together, we created a short film called Dart that depicts a ritual of painting on the water, coupled with the readings in both Afrikaan and English. This work explores notions of communal and ancestral pain, as well as the power of the landscape to perform and heal. The goal of the GNAP project is to bring artists together from across the globe, to work together at a single location, to think deeply about place and time, and especially in this case in 2018 mm -hmm. about ephemerality. This is one example of the ways in which artists can function as global citizens. The idea of the ripple effect, if you will, with residencies providing the opportunity to create and disseminate knowledge. Hanin, do you want to talk about your ideas of global citizenry and climate change in relation to art and artists? One of the things that um, that started my practice actually was that I went to um, the Netherlands because Afrikaans is a hybridized form of Dutch and um, uh, and my my culture really is a hybrid form uh, a, a mix of Dutch, African, German, various European um, influences, French also. And uh, I, I went to the Netherlands because I thought that 
that um, when I'm there, I might feel this sense of belonging when I'm there because the language is quite close to mine and so on. But I ended up yearning for living things from my home. You think, Ian, you also have protosea there where you are. It's a, it's a very specific plant that grew on Gondwana land. And so when it split up, you, uh, it formed Australia, uh, South America, and um, Africa, South Africa. And so, um, so my, my projects um, in my local environment, I started to understand global issues. Um, I started to understand monoculture farming and how it was destroying the habitat of these flowers. I started to understand um, why my ancestors plowed the lands and destroyed indigenous um, nature without really understanding what they were doing. And I really understood where I fit into the world as an Afrikaner. And I think when you find your, your place within your ancestry and you find your place in the world globally through actually going in through the details, and I'm not telling the story very well, <laughs> but um, because it's a long story, but uh, I really found that I started to understand climate issues across the world. Hey, yeah. Europeans have been in Australia for just over 200 years. Um, the indigenous people have been here for 40, 50,000. And of course, in Africa, it's, uh, it's where <laughs> humans evolved over you know, tens of millions of years. Um, but one thing that the science tells us is that most species don't actually hang around all that long um, in the history of Earth. They, they, they go extinct or they evolve into something else. And the average lifespan of, of large mammals, which is what we are, is between 100,000 and a million years. And that's about how long we've been around. <laughs> uh, look, so that's, that's a scary thought. Um, you can't, so, something's going to happen. Um, sometime, could be next year, it could be in a, another couple hundred thousand years. So the, the ephemerality of existence is not just an individual, it's as, it's as cultures, it's as societies. And um, one of the things looking back at the indigenous culture in Australia is that large elements have, have been wiped out by colonialisation. Um, many areas now, uh, the, the people are, uh, are fighting back. So as you, as you introduced me, I, we say we live on Ghana land and that's the land of the original custodians of the area of, of South Australia within which we live. And it's become common now for, for people to acknowledge that at any public event, um, from the football to a, to a council, city council meeting or anything. Um, some people say it's tokenism, but in the end it matters and people become more aware of this long, long history of, of, of ownership, of, of looking at, after the land and looking after the, the, the um, the wildlife and, and plants too. Plants are a critical part of that. Um, you know, with the pandemic, we've had such a shift to this video conferencing way of communicating with people. And one of the absolute joys for me that has come out of the pandemic, believe it or not, is a new collective that I'm part of called the Women's yeah. Environmental yeah. Photography Collective. And I'm working with five other women photographers who are all making issues, all making work about environmental issues, we would never in a million years have been able to do this together yeah. because we wouldn't have thought about it before the pandemic. Mm. So, right, this idea of global citizenry is shifting as technology is coming into our lives in different ways, right, as different sort of barriers are coming up in different ways. Um, and we are malleable and we're figuring mm. out ways to work around it and i think that's just a really exciting way to move forward you know the pandemic has caused so much destruction and damage and and pain but i think there are things coming out of this that can lead us into new and exciting directions as far as things like collaborations 
ways to think about climate change, ways to address, um, you know, issues of communication. You know, so I'm hopeful in a sense, right? Um, even though we're in still a very dark time. Yeah. All right, I'd like to talk about the role of the artist as activist and art as cultural spark. Toni Morrison famously, and dare I say problematically said, <laughs> all of that art for art's sake stuff is BS. She declared, what are these people talking about? Are you really telling me that Shakespeare wasn't writing about the kings? All good art is political. There is none that isn't. And the ones that try hard not to be political are saying, we love the status quo, <laughs> right? That's quite a quote. And I feel like a lot of um, artists have used this quote and talked about this quote in depth. And I'd like us to sort of talk about, um, you know, what is, what, how can we talk about things like borders and civic responsibility, kindness, humanitarianism, justice, and stewardship in the Anthropocene if art is or is not political, right? Can, can you guys share some examples of your own work that might function in this way as, you know, art as political statement? Yeah, well, I, I agree 100% with, with Toni Morrison's statement. Um, it's a position I've come to perhaps gradually. I wasn't born with it, um, although I've always been interested in the sort of political aspects of, of science and, and everything related to that. Um, and as I've moved more into video art in particular, um, I'd have to say that every, I think all my videos these days have a political element in the sense that of they're trying to critique something about what we're doing or not doing. So Colony Collapse is filmed around um, South Australia, New South Wales, various parts of Australia. And as we said before, Australia's been colonised by Europeans for you know, 200 years, 250 years or something. And the mark on the environment is, it's been horrendous. And it's also been horrendous on the indigenous populations through um, all of Australia. So the theme line of, of this, this piece, Connolly Collapse, is um, we should not be here. And that's sort of like a refrain which comes through through the whole video and um, refers to ghosts and farewells, the text which is coming up now. Um, they're all around us are the, if you look, are the signs of the Indigenous people that were here and still are in many of the areas, that the Aboriginal people. It's in place names, it's in artefacts which can be found if you know where to look, and indeed the populations um, uh, are still living um, in most of the big cities. So that's a really important thing. Um, and then there's an impact on the environment. So in order to, to illustrate that, this video is uses images of old colonial buildings, uh, various other places around the cities, which have all been manipulated. No, no image in this film is is the original image. That they're, they're all they're all composited and animated um, from in various ways. So that's a way in which, when I mentioned that art gives a way of of imagining a world that you don't see otherwise. That's one of the reasons I, I've gone to, gone to, to video because it lets me create visions that I can see in my head. Maybe I don't even see them until I, I make them. Um, that as a as a writer it was fun and important to be able to generate ambiguity. But with with the uh, video, you can then actually let other people see what you might be seeing. And the exclusion principle is a direct appropriation of some science. Um, into a, a creative and I suppose and a, in this case a very political issue. So over the last 10 years or so, 15 years probably now, um, Australian government has had an absolutely horrendous policy on border controls, um, demonising refugees, uh, doing everything in their power to keep refugees out of Australia. It's, it's, it's horrendous and both sides of politics have contributed to, to, the, to these policies. And 
there's a sector of the um, of the population which thinks it's a great idea. There's a sector of the population which thinks it's it's terrible, and there's almost no middle ground there. So I've got this this video is about wall and barriers, and it's made up of what were thousands of photos I took of corrugated iron uh, fences and buildings which are everywhere in Australia. It's a common building material in Australia, and the text is from a description of the Pauli's exclusion principle, which is one of the core elements of, of quantum mechanics, which basically explains chemistry. It's how chemistry works. And without chemistry, you don't, you don't have life. Um, and simply it is, you can't have two, um, two components of the quantum world in the same place at the same time. That's what the, what the, um, what the principle states. And so I took the text and personalised it. Basically, all, all the phrases in the, are just off the Wikipedia um, description of the, of the Pauli exclusion principle. And I just put them into the first person. Great. Thank you for sharing those. Honey, and I wonder if you have some works you would like to talk about. This, uh, this work that I actually um, am painting here from um, a visit that I, or it, it's a result or a response to a visit to a farm that um, belonged to my grandmother. And um, through the process of revisiting this farm and to go and see um, how my ancestors were implicit in um, destroying the the vegetation of specific flower i was looking for i found a, a dry silent river and so this work is called raswater which means raging waters and i was trying to resound the um the river and what happened here was exactly that thing of i wanted the uh the clay to drip down and to show me um, sort of a waterfall effect and instead it actually went upwards and it made grasses like you could see in that image. Um, these images that are now showing is uh, after much hunting I eventually found this little flower that I was looking for but it was hugely endangered. And my whole project, which was supposed to be a flower painting project, um, became a project about loss and about uh, destruction. Um, and so the place where I found this little flower eventually um, had huge um, geological digs where they were testing the soil to see if the soil was good for developing more vineyards in the area. And this was devastating to me because I had taken a year to find this specific flower, which was so incredibly endangered. And that resulted in this work here, which is called Wat die Grond onthou, or What the Soil Remembers. And it's um, six panels size of the human grave and behind the panels i painted them in a the color of the flower the front of the panels are made of the soil from the river the alluvium soil and the back there you can see that's reflected light that's just glowing almost like a sunset the artist today has to become someone who is part of their community again it's the thing of the rippling out you know you you start with your own community and you create a community um that actually is part of your practice like your practice margaret with the women photographers i've got a group of women that i practice with and we are painters um and it's incredible to community support but also to have people non-artists if we can call them that because i agree with ian i think it's all artists um non-artists non also 
to involve them in your work, in your practice, and in your rituals, I think is very important. For me, that is my role part is, is that I'm going back into that role as healer, as seer, as, you know, um, the, for want of a better word, the shaman of the village. All right, my next question for, for both of you is, the Brodo experiment is deeply interested in the potential of substantive real world collaborations between arts and sciences. So can we talk about the potential of art to inspire science? People often talk about you know, the so-called divide between art and science. And at, on one hand, it's, it's real in the, referring back to something we mentioned earlier that science is necessarily data driven in the terms of its output anyway, and everything needs to be validated. And, and art is, is freed of, of that constraint. But when I've worked with artists, now for a long time we've uh, did a lot of work in in doing public science bringing bringing science to the public for the same reasons that we talked about before why art should be part of the public arena so should should the science and and most of the time i was working we, we did um, public science programs of various sorts which is a lot of fun and then a lot of that was we ended up doing in collaboration with artists, with choreographers, with musicians, with um, theatre producers. And coming out of that, I ended up actually working with one of the Australian Dance Theatre, produce, doing some science input for a couple of their productions. Um, I made lots of friends in the, in the local arts community before I moved into it my, myself through these, this, this, this way of not using art in the service of science, which I really object to that notion that artists somehow illustrate science. Um, no, um, the artists, um, I realised, had this incredible experience, incredible knowledge of, of the world and how to negotiate it. And then in our laboratory, one of our major techniques was uh, is advanced microscopy. I started off my life um, as an electron microscopist using huge machines to look at very, very tiny things. Um, and I continued doing microscopy right up till I retired. And Catherine became really interested in that, in the notion of my microscopes as an extension of seeing. And we got into the whole idea of what's seeing and how do you actually see and interpret what you're doing, which is absolutely core to understanding what we're looking at down these fancy microscopes, but it's also core to art and everything else around us. And mm -hmm. I'm, I used to manage our microscope facility at the university, a big central core facility with dozens of incredibly expensive machines in it and I used for my own research and while Catherine was there a whole bunch of these machines got decommissioned they were no longer doing the work that at a level that was required for this so that became um, the microscope project here and the microscope project um, was a huge exhibition it ran for two months in a big gallery in the city where we took um, apart the microscopes and rebuilt them into new things. And we reimagined the life of the people who made the microscopes, the people who used the microscopes, um, the microscopes themselves. Um, and so there was, uh, the, we had the thesaurus of reconstructed microscopy. Coming out of that, that was a huge amount of work. There's um, five of us on the project, but three of us worked really, really closely with each other. So me, and a glass artist and Catherine as a as a maker um, and we made this installation which ran for two months in one of the biggest galleries in town um, what the consequence of that was apart from me realizing I actually can do this sort of art stuff um, was that people coming into the gallery were looking at pieces of, of technology in a way, first of all, they didn't know it existed. And secondly, seeing it in a way that no, no scientific description would ever, ever have, have, have been able to provide. And yet the science wasn't ignored in any, in any sense. I just wanted to say on, on this issue of art and science, in my experience that, um, the project I did where I was looking for this um, endangered flower, 
um, turned into, as I said, quite a political project and quite a multifaceted and interdisciplinary project where I ended up working with botanists, ecologists, horticulturists, mm. and eventually um, And what happened was that the, the exhibition that I had at the end of my process really had a huge impact on the farmers as well as the, the guys who are the nature conservation people, because I invited them all. And because a dialogue was opened around um, these issues of conservation and people needing to plow land in order to survive, um, they could talk to each other and I could talk to them. So in a sense, bringing the sciences and the arts together can facilitate education. So I think the one point I wanted to make is that it's educational. And the other point is that we finding in science, um, recently in, in geology as well, that scientists come upon realizations that have huge philosophical repercussions and artists can help to work these out and to also look at how to responsibly work with with certain discoveries and what is the um, the philosophical impact on humanity through certain scientific breakthroughs which i think we tend to skip over these days um, and i do think that those things are important to consider i'd like to wrap up with a question about sort of art and value of art um, you know one aspect of the brodo project is this revisioning of the global financial systems and i wonder what would need to happen in terms of cultural value of art to allow for more innovation and more ideas of collaboration that we've been talking about and are so important to all of our works do you have any ideas about this reshaping of a system and how how we can talk about the value of art to help elevate it honey do you want to do you want to take this one um yeah i i must say when ian was talking earlier about understanding the privilege of being an artist um i was thinking of rilke's um letter to a young poet uh, where he says if you wake up in the night and you know that you must write it's a matter mm. of death uh, i feel that way about art and so i can't say that um uh, that in any way, um, the work that I do, uh, my mother always says, you, you, you don't, um, you can't say you earning that money because, you know, it's, it's not what I, I, I deserve. I should be paid more. Um, the, the commodification of art, um, has a huge impact on artists and, and our ability to actually contribute what we would like to um, but what I am doing is I'm finding a way to work as an artist uh, without relying on the commodification of my work it's very important to me um, and what's naturally happening is I am getting people to support me um, through various ways unfortunately might have still a long way to go before people really value artists um, when ian said the scientists in the lab has to respect the artist's insight we we sit with um we sit with the stigma of artists being um intuitive but not really having facts or aren't worth listening to but actually we sit with a hell of a, a skill set um, mm -hmm. in terms of thinking and our brains work very differently to other people's brains. I used to be an interior designer and architect before mm -hmm. this, and now I'm, and I can honestly tell you that my brain has become more fluid and my thinking has become more fluid and, um, I'm a different person because of that. In Australia, 
art and science are equally totally devalued by the political bodies of both parties on both sides, despite the fact that more people go to art galleries than go to sport, and Australia is notorious, famous for being a sporting nation. Many, many more people go to galleries than go to, go to the big sporting events. And despite the vast amount of, pe of money spent on science, Australia's spend on science is, a, is one of the lowest in the OECD. Um, scientists and artists are equally pilloried all the time by politicians as being time wasters, money wasters, and generally a, a, a burden on society. Um, and we're always, as artists and scientists, having to justify our positions, always, despite the fact that the public has incredible interest in both art and science and everything in between. So I get really dis desperate about this. I'm, and personally, I'm, I'm fortunate, I'm retired, so I don't need to earn money from my art. And, but all, the majority of my videos are available for free. And occasionally, exhibitions say, well, what, what do you want to put a price on it? So, mm, I don't know, you can have it, it's, it's there. So I don't know the answer to that. And it's been a problem um, for, for both scientists and artists, despite the fact that the budget for science is way, way bigger and the budget for, for arts. Um, I and mean, artists don't just don't get paid in Australia. <laughs> I think so there's ridiculous. some interesting uh, ways in which, yeah. you know, the sciences can incorporate the arts in their budget funding. You know, in the States, we have the National Science Foundation mm -hmm. grants, and mm -hmm. there are several lines dedicated to outreach and such. And, and that can be one way to, for scientists to find collaborations intentionally to to bring artists in. But I think there's something bigger here that we're we're probably missing and that's how do we change a culture who who doesn't value yeah. right yeah. the art. Yeah. And yeah. and how can we look back, I think, to the past instead of the future for a second here and think about ways that it used to be valued and artists used to be exalted because we knew that their thinking was dynamic and unique. Um, so with that, we're going to have to wrap up, but I really appreciate both of you and your time. Um, we will be joining the live studio or the live audience after this. And I'm really energized and inspired by our time together. And I look forward to our discussion and questions from the audience. So thank you both. Yeah, thank you. All right. Hi, Ian. Hi. Hello. Hi. Good to see you again. Yes. <laughs> um, this is our time to be able to engage with the live audience. We are um, open to questions or comments uh, and conversation. We have about 20 minutes together now. If you would like to ask a question, you can put your question in the chat um, box and I can be sure to relay it to our panelists. So please don't be shy. Um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I actually had some further thoughts about some of the discussion that we just watched. And I wonder if we could sort of pick up where we left off a little bit. Um, specifically at the end, we were talking about this idea of how do we elevate the artist um, to a position in which we value their work. And I wonder if we can just sit for a minute and think about how we reverse engineer this problem. What does it look like when we are valued, we are appreciated, we are um, put in the mix of so many different areas so that our the ways that we think, the fluidity of our brain, as Hanin said previously, right, that the dynamism of our ideas is really put to use. And how did we get there, right? What has changed in the world that has allowed us to get to that place, if we can imagine that future? <laughs> For me, I think that the first place to start, and I am the person who's interested in 
the local and then going global. So for me, the first um, place to start is with myself to really, really value and take seriously the work that I do and to notice how it's changing the world around me, which I have noticed. And I'm often shy to talk about that, but there's been huge changes that has happened because of certain um, performance pieces I've done or rituals I've done. Um, and through, through me doing that and people realizing how it's changing um, their situation, I'm hoping that, you know, um, it, it will spread like the ripples of our film, that it will eventually spread out into the world. But I do think it starts with us really knowing, you know, often when a magician has done a, a trick and he can see the, he or she can see the effect of their magic, they don't put up their hand and say, hey, by the way, it started raining now because of me. Um, but they know, they know what they've done. Yeah, so I think there's something in that. Yeah, I, I think the part of the way forward is is recognising the strength of of the next level out too, from what and then said, from the individual to the to local community. And um, the, the notion of community art is actually pretty well established here in, in South Australia, I have to say. So each year if in towards the end of the year, there's the South Australia Living Arts Festival, which runs for a, for a month and has thousands of exhibitions and artists contributing. Um, and it can be anything from just your home studio through to uh, one of the large galleries. And m many people who do mostly visual art in this context, um, they have little workshops, they have, um, they have little small galleries or they have community groups which then come together and put an exhibition on um, for, for a month, up to a month anyway, um, during during September usually. And it's it's huge. So the, the, the local newspaper publishes a, a, a brochure or directory for this, which is as big as the newspaper. Um, it's you know, over a 1,000 entries usually. And it's well sponsored by local, local businesses. Um, it's well well um, publicised through the, through the local local media, um, and there are other events like that ar around the country, and I think they they illustrate the fact that we might have said in the original discussion. I mean, just for anybody, everybody's creative in some way, and uh, how you channel that creativity um, is ends up informing whether you call yourself an artist or not or whether you just like playing some music or you just like doing a bit of drawing on a Saturday afternoon or something. And those different levels matter to some degree, but they don't underline the, undermine the principle that that art and, or, and, any, and creative activities is actually core to being human. It's actually core to what we do. And going back to the last point we made in, our, in the pre-recorded discussion, I, I just don't get it that governments don't understand that <laughs> and um and and we we have arguments all the time i'm sure they happen in other places as well where you get asked as a as a creative person it could be a, a writer or a visual artist or a musician oh how about you contribute something to our event or organization oh yeah that sounds a pretty good idea what what how much are we going to get paid for oh no no it's just good for you to be there um, and the standard arguments, you never expect a chef to come around and just, you know, cook dinner for nothing for you. Um, so why should artists just give away their, their, their work um, for, for no value? Now, that's different from the point we made during the recorded discussion saying, well, I like to make my videos freely available. But if I get asked to do something, I, we, sh we should get recompensed for it in the same way as anybody else does, like your, your mechanic or a painter or a builder or a, or a politician for that matter. And they don't, you know. So um, the, 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 the way, way forward, I think, is, is ultimately 
you have to apply pressure on on the political process. And I don't know how you do that other than through um, some le- some way of of organi- having organised bodies like the equivalent of unions um, for, for artists. And again, we have those in Australia, and they've, they've for each of the various areas, they're well organised, they're well financed by by the members. Um, they have a loud voice, but doesn't always doesn't seem to have much effect, unfortunately. So I'm very pessimistic about this. I have to say. It, you talking about um, you know people wanting to to get work for free. I, I'm an educator, and I constantly get emails from people yeah. emailing me asking if my students would be available to shoot X project, photograph X project um, for their portfolio. Yeah. And and I have a, a now canned response that I send back to, and I get probably two or three of these requests a week that I send yeah. back, and I say, uh, "What's your budget?" You know, and you wouldn't ask a roofer who has a specified skill, right, a technical skill to come over and put a roof on your house for their portfolio. Right. It's it's yeah. it's a bit obnoxious to ask for these things for free. Yes, these are students, but they are trained and they are skilled. And and, and this is one small way that I feel like I can reach out to a wide variety of voices because I get these requests from all over the place, you name it. I get it from not-for-profit organizations. I get it from hospitals. I get it from all sorts of, you know, the community organizations. And while I want to partner with them and I want to put the arts, right, you know, hand in hand with these great community organizations, I want them to understand the value of an artist, even from a young age. And so that's one small way that I try to educate the public uh, onto the value of an artist. So we have a question in the chat box. Uh, I thought that I would ask you both. Um, Donna Evans wants to know, how does your experience affect your point of view on climate? Well, um, through the experiences that I have, my performances that I've done, um, and because I have an animistic outlook um, in life, I believe that everything is connected and that, and so our consciousness is also reflected in our environment. Because of that, I believe that if we change ourselves, we can also change the climate. And because I'm also from Africa, where rainmaking is quite a um still an, a practice that is alive um the magic of rain making i really believe that we can affect the weather and i think our weather and our earth is all is is in a state because of all the reasons that scientists give but i think there's also a much deeper reason which is our inextricable relationship with the earth um, on a very deep level, also on an intellectual and emotional and non-physical level. And so what I've learned um, from my experiences and my experiments in the natural world is that it's all about relationship and the way we relate to the natural world can affect um the weather <laughs> <laughs> well in- interesting enough coming from a completely different background and different viewpoint and even a different philosophy i have to say too um i, I agree with that <laughs> my, my my original training was was in zoology and very very broad ranging from um on the evolution of biology and uh, ecology and all the rest of it and um, then as I progressed more into more cell, cell biology, what, what you end up realising there is exactly what Hanin said, but from a, from a different point of view in many ways, that everything's connected and it's a matter of, and you're looking at different scales. And the thing I loved about the science I did um, was, was the scale hopping. You're going from say how how we move blah, 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 um, in the, in the world how we think how we talk and all the ba- all the basis of that then I go down to the cells down to the molecules um, even down down to quantum levels if we, if you need to 
and it's continuous. And uh, they think, and there are different issues at different scales, and that's really important to understand. So what's happening at a cellular level is not the same thing as what's happening at your body. That's not the same thing as happening at your know, community level. And that's not the same thing as happening at global level. But they're all connected. They all interact. And and you, you pull a string over here and something's going to happen over there. Um, guaranteed. It's actually guaranteed. And sometimes you can predict what's going to happen and sometimes you can't. So that's... That's very, very strong in, 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 in the way I look at the world and the way I look at, look at climate. The other thing is that I'm, I'm getting old now, um, but when I was a student back in the 70s at uni, university, people were saying then there was the, the Club of Rome um, from, from the 1960s was um, making predictions saying, oh, you know, 40 years' time, 50 years' time, if we don't do something, we're, we're going to be in trouble. And here we are, 50 years on, and we're in trouble. Um, and again, it's, in, it's, interesting, it's, it's really fantastic hearing from Hanina about the South African experience because Australia, in, in many ways, is, is very similar. We even have produce. I've got some growing in the garden. Um, but the, but we're always facing climate troubles here in Australia. Even from when the, the first British colonials came out here in South Australia, there was a line called Goiter's Line where a very, very astute surveyor looked at the land, looked at the, the plants that were growing there and used some knowledge and some strong insight and said, it's, you can't farm north of this line. Look at the plants. They don't, they don't have enough water. But they then had three or four good years of some rain and all the, and all the um, pastoralists went up there and built all these towns and city towns out there and, and pastoral leases and everything, and they're all gone. They're all gone. I mean, the Gordas line was completely correct, and the Gordas line is actually moving at an incredibly fast rate because more and more of the country is becoming um, I- impossible to, to even run low-level pastoralism on. So in the last, last few years, I mean, we've had droughts that have lasted five, six years. We've had horrendous bushfires where half the, half the forests of, the, of Australia burnt to, um, 18 months ago. Um, terrible floods, which have, the effect of which, as in many parts of the world, are, have been amplified by, by just completely out of control land clearing. Um, so you have huge amounts of water washing off the Great Barrier Reefs in huge trouble. It's the largest living organism on earth and it's and it's large huge proportions of it are, are dead and it's entirely human made. So um that to go back to the question, the point of view is that from from the science it's it's obvious it's all connected. It's just so obvious. And when you hear someone saying we're gonna build a new coal coal mine up up with on the on the Queensland coast 20 kilometres from the Great Barrier Reef, it's going to stuff it up. It's going to make it worse. <laughs> yeah. It, it makes me think, you know, I'm a sailor in addition to being a photographer and an academic. And so I spend a lot of my time living on a sailboat and mm. sailing, ocean sailing, so blue ocean sailing. And I've, you know, become intimately connected to the sea and to marine life. And over the last eight years that I've been doing this sort of sailing, I've seen incredible changes to the water, to the water mm-hmm. quality, to the level of, you know, sargassum weed, to the changes in harmful algal blooms, right, that are appearing off the coast of the U.S. at just skyrocketing levels over the last 10 to 15 years. And so I think that, you know, at coming back to sort of what Hanin said, looking locally, right, can really help you understand what is happening globally. Looking locally from my tiny little island sailboat, right, is this very different perspective that I have on the world, and it's very, very frightening. We have about five minutes left, and we have a few more questions in the chat box I'd like to get to. Um, Rita Leduc asks, she said that Hanin referred to her work as political. I wondered if the panelists might be able to speak to the difference they find, if any, between political art and activist art. Um, she says, I'd also like to love to hear more from Margaret about her opinion of the quote she referenced. Well, I'll let the panelists uh, start first. Hanin, do you want to address this idea of political versus activist? 
Yes, I'll just keep it short. Um, I think uh, my art is political because um, it, it it touches on cultural issues, um, social issues, cultural issues, but also natural issues, and questions such as what does it, what does ownership of land mean, and you know, so so it's political from that point of view, and um, activist art. Uh, activism for me is something that I don't really support the true activism because it tends to polarize people. When I had to work with farmers and with nature conservationists and they there was this war going on between them, I realized that what I am is a facilitator or a link that helps the two parties to think differently to understand each other and to maybe possibly find some solutions. So that is a, a softer kind of activism, which I th have found works better than to, to polarize. Sure. Ian, do you want to take the same question? Um, well, I, I agree, basically. Um, yeah, if art is taking a stand on anything and it's political, by, almost by definition, Going at, being activist means usually being involved in a particular cause for a particular purpose for a particular time. And there are times and places for doing that, and art can contribute to that. Um, I've contributed poetry to political events, for example, and written stuff specially. But um, I, Hanoon's point is a very important one, is that you often, sometimes there's a, there's a need for activism. There's no doubt you have to go out into the streets and, and get angry and all the rest of it. But you have, you have to then turn that into something productive and collaboration, cooperation, um, making difficult choices, making compromises is a, is a critical part of that. Great. We have another question. We've got about two and a half minutes left. Timothy yeah. McDonald says, we are exploring a thought about creating a nature bank to direct finance into enterprises that pay dividends to nature. Such a bank of nature could also pay dividends to art and science. Any thoughts on how we might engage the arts and science communities in thinking through with us how to design patronage from such a bank of nature for the arts and sciences? I, I wish. Think there's, there's some great examples. For example, the river uh, close to us, there's a group called the Friends of the Rivers of Halt Bay, which is here in Cape, uh, Cape Town. And it's a group of scientists and local people that's trying to clean up the river and trying to manage the community also so that they stop messing in the river and so forth. And I have seen many arts projects that could be um, could actually develop out of this and that will heal the environment because you can imagine village with a healed river will really um, uh, affect the whole community. So I think those kind of projects need to be um, written up and proposed and the, the scientists and the artists need to write these proposals together and then send it in to, to, um, to a patron so that they can ascertain whether you know they want to fund that or not. I think that's the kind of things, um, things that are already happening in communities where people can see they need funding, um, those kind of things. Well, I'm gonna stop us right there. We've got about 30 seconds <laughs> left and we have, a hard, we have a hard cut at the end of this, but I do wanna invite viewers into the post-session room um, where Hanin and Ian and I will be um, to continue the conversation and we can get to any questions that we weren't able to answer in the chat box. I wanna thank everybody for coming today. Again, thank Ian, thank Hanin, um, and thank Roto for putting the conference together and engaging us in these amazing conversations that are so important to the future of our planet and to the future of the arts and sciences.